dynamics of inviscid flows. In the last chapter, we were discussing about the kinematics. So, we were not discussing about the forcing parameters which are involved to influence the flow. So, we have discussed about the motion. Now, we are going to see that what are the forcing parameters which influence the motion and how they are related to the motion. Uh, when we talk about inviscid flows, what we essentially mean is initially we will discuss about cases where viscous forces are not present. So, it is a simplified situation of the reality, but at the same time uh, it will provide us with a lot of important insight which we will use later on when we will be discussing about the dynamics of viscous flows. So, when we will be considering or focusing our attention in this particular chapter, we will be considering cases when viscous forces are not there or negligible. To start with the discussion on this, what we will try to do, we will try to write the equation of motion for a fluid element where viscous forces are not present. So, when viscous forces are not present, the kinds of forces which are there are the surface forces in terms of the normal components which are manifested through pressure and some body forces which may be like the gravity forces. Keeping that in mind, let us say that we want to write the equation of motion for a fluid element. Uh, let us say that it is a two dimensional fluid element. It need not always be two dimensional, but uh, if we are writing the equation of motion along a particular direction, then uh, like for simplicity we can take it as a two dimensional one for illustration. So, let us say that we take a two dimensional fluid element as an example. Fundamentally, it is always three dimensional. So, the third dimension you may consider as one or some uniform third dimension. Let us say that these dimensions are delta x and delta y. We will quickly identify what are the forces which are acting on the fluid element only along x. So, we will identify forces along x because we are interested to write the equation of motion along x. Uh, so, other forces will not show. So, it is not a complete free body diagram, only the x component of forces uh, will be shown. So, here you have force due to pressure. So, if P is the pressure here, then P times delta y, maybe times 1, where 1 is the width, is the force that acts on the left face due to pressure. Force that acts on the right face due to pressure is what? We have encountered such situation earlier. So, P plus this into dx times delta y into 1. <coughs> Along x, these are the only surface forces because other faces will have surface forces along y. Body force may be there. Let us say that uh, B x is the body force per unit mass. So, rho into B x into delta x into delta y is the body force component along x because rho into delta x into delta y is the mass of the fluid element. So, we can write the Newton's second law of motion for the fluid element. That is, we can write resultant force along x is equal to mass of the fluid element times acceleration along x. Maybe you can write delta m, it is a small mass to acknowledge that. So, we will try to simplify this expression. Resultant force along x is P into delta y minus P plus this one with respect to into delta y, this thing then plus rho B x delta x delta y is equal to the mass of the fluid element is what rho delta x delta y times acceleration along x. What is acceleration along x? This we have discussed in the kinematics. So, what is that? This 
this is the acceleration along x this we have derived in the kinematics see when we were discussing about the rigid body type of motion of fluid elements then we did not use this expression we were using as an expression as if the entire fluid is having a particular acceleration disregarding the deformation within it so now uh, the different gradients of velocity will become important uh, which was not there or which we kept ourselves abstracted of when we just wrote some acceleration when it was moving like a rigid body now we are more detailing it so we are looking into the detailed expression that uh, that reflects that acceleration so this is acceleration along x now you can uh, cancel various terms so first this term will go away and then uh, like you will have uh, okay let us just correct it a little bit it was delta x right we did not consider it dx delta x so just uh, change this dx to delta x because we took our element as delta x and then uh, we can cancel delta x into delta y from all the terms because these are small tending to 0 but not actually equal to 0. So what we are left with we are left with a simplified expression plus rho b x is equal to rho this uh, very simple expression is also known as euler's equation of motion along x similar expressions we can write for the motion along y and z we are not repeating it because it is very trivial now what uh, does this equation of motion contain if you look into it it is fundamentally like Newton's second law of motion where viscous forces are not considered so uh, this right hand side is something like the mass into acceleration left hand side is the force effect of the force which is acting so one force is because of the pressure gradient and another force is because of the body force so these two forces are considered so it is just a different way of writing Newton's second law of motion for a fluid where viscous effects are not present and any other force other than uh, this body force of this particular form we are not considering. Let us take an example to illustrate that how we can make use of this. <coughs> The example is uh, like this let us say that you have a velocity field V given by say AX I minus AYJ where A is a constant number and a dimension number to adjust the dimensions in the two sides we are interested to find out what is the difference between pressure at two points given by x1 comma y1 and x2 comma y2 it is given that g that is the acceleration due to gravity acts along negative z direction So the question is what is the difference in pressure between these two points okay. The problem is very simple but it will at least give us some idea of how to make use of uh, this expression. A and B are not functions of time so it is a steady flow field. Let us write this equation say along x for this one. 
So, if we want to write this Euler's equation along x, so we have minus of partial derivative of pressure with respect to x plus what is dx? There is no x component of body force, Go body force only acts along negative z. So, this plus 0 is equal to rho. Velocity field is not a function of time here, A is a time independent constant that is given. So, the time derivative will be 0. Then, so what is u and v here? This is u and this is v, okay, with the minus sign of course, includes the minus sign. So, rho, so u is a x into a, that is this term. The other terms are not there because u, u does not have any dependence on y and z. So, the other terms are not there. So, this is the equation of motion along x. What will be the equation of motion along y? Just it will be similar to this. There is no body force along y and rho right hand side what is going to happen? This u is only going to be replaced with v. So, the term that will remain relevant is only v into partial derivative of v with respect to y. Okay. So, it is minus a y into minus a. Let us consider the z component. Now you have a body force along z. So what is that? So b z is equal to minus g. So minus rho g is equal to the right hand side. U u will be replaced by w and there is no w component of velocity, it is a two dimensional flow field, so it is 0. So, it is possible to integrate these expressions to find out how p varies with x, y and z. So, uh, let us integrate that, let us say we integrate this one with respect to x. So, we get p here as what? Minus rho a square x dx will become x square by 2 plus function of y and z, right. For this it will become p equal to very similar minus rho a square now y square by 2 plus a function of x and z and what will this give p equal to minus rho g z plus a function of x and y. All these three expressions are representing the same pressure field. So, we can compare these to get these three functions. So, let us compare these and get the three functions. If you compare what functions you get, what is F1? F1 is a function of y and z. So, minus rho a square y square by 2 then minus rho g z this is f1 f2 function of x and z so minus rho a square x square by 2 minus rho g z and f3 minus rho a square x square by 2 minus rho 
a square y square by 2 ok. So, the expression for pressure becomes minus rho a square x square by 2 minus rho a square y square by 2 minus rho g z right. So, this you can write minus half rho a square x square plus a square y square is u square plus v square. So, that is the square of the resultant velocity. So, let us say capital V square minus rho g z that means p plus half rho v square plus rho g z equal to 0. Now, when we write this there is a lack of generality here. What is the lack of generality? When we consider this f1, f2, f3, we did not consider a constant. So, fundamentally we should also have a constant there, where that constant may be eliminated depending on a choice of a reference frame, but that is not done a priori. That is after you get the general expression, then only that is possible. So, a very important thing here is that each of these should be augmented with a constant. So, what it means is that this plus c will be there. So, this will become in place of 0, it will become some constant. This looks very familiar to you, it is like a Bernoulli's equation. Now, do not get a wrong impression here that the Bernoulli's equation is always valid and that is why you can write it in this form. There is a speciality of this problem because of which the Bernoulli's equation gets valid between any two points 1 and 2. So, this is a point 1 and this is a point 2. Solving the problem is trivial, you can find out p1 minus p2 by substituting the velocities respectively at x1 comma y1 and x2 comma y2. That is uh, a straightforward exercise. Yes. The direct comparison of the equation is possible because they represent the same pressure. This is by observation. See, I mean, when you write, when you say that these two are equal or these three are equal, it should be such that it does not contain any function of x, y, or z which falls beyond the functions written here. I mean there are certain things which you can do just by common sense and this is one of the big things in mathematics which you can do by a little common sense and that is what is expected uh, when you solve such problems. Now uh, when you come to this uh, conclusion that it is it is like a Bernoulli's equation, in fact it is, uh, it is of the same form and we therefore can apply it between any two points 1 and 2 it is not a general conclusion that we must remember and we will do it rigorously to show that when it is valid and when it is not valid. This is very, very important because all of you are very, very habituated in using Bernoulli's equation anywhere and everywhere you like. So, we will try to see, we will try to restrict you so that you do not apply it anywhere and everywhere and we will see that when it is applicable and when it is not. But before that, this problem at least tells us that this is a very easy problem and it demonstrates that in this case it is possible to apply it between two points 1 and 2. So, what is the speciality of this problem? Let us look into it. See for every problem there is one aspect that is how to solve a problem that is fine, but there is a greater aspect how to develop a more detailed insight on what the problem is about. So, we are now trying to do that problem is solved, but it is not enough. Let us see that what insight it gives us. Try to find out what is the rate of deformation and angular velocity of this flow. So, if you recall that if we want to find out the <coughs> say rate of deformation epsilon dot x y, what is that? So, 
So, in this case what is the value of this identical equal to 0, angular velocity in x y plane half of this one, because each of these terms are 0 you have this also identically equal to 0. So, what does it show? It shows that if there is a fluid element located in this flow field, it does not have any shear deformation, it does not have any rotation. That means, if its edges were originally parallel to x and y, those will remain always parallel to x and y. If it is incompressible, what will happen? It might stretch along say x. So, it should reduce its length along y, so that the volume is preserved. So, it is like if the fluid element was originally like this, maybe it will become once like that and it will it will change its configuration in such a way that angularly there is no change, only there are changes in linear dimension, but ensuring incompressibility because it also represents an incompressible flow field that you can check by checking that divergence of the velocity vector is 0. So, it is an incompressible flow. So, that is one important observation. So, the important observation is it does not have any shear effect. Next is it does not have any angular velocity. So, it is like an irrotational flow because an irrotational flow has no angular velocity or no vorticity so to say. Now, let us try to see that what will be the equations of the streamline in this case. So, we are interested to find out the equations of the streamline. It will give us even a deeper insight and we will relate it to one of the movies that we saw in our previous lecture. So, if you write the equation of the streamline, it is dx by u is equal to dy by v, right. This is the equation of the streamline. So, you have d x by a x is equal to d y by minus a y, a is not equal to 0, you can cancel that and if you integrate it, you will get ln x is equal to minus ln y plus a constant let us say ln k. So, this gives an equation of the streamline of the form x y equal to k, which is like a rectangular hyperbola. That means, if you have say, uh, if you consider this as x axis and maybe this as y axis, it is possible that you have your streamlines in this way. So, if you have a fluid element originally like this, maybe the fluid element is coming down along the streamline. I am just trying to make you recall one of the movies that we showed to you that the fluid element is coming down like this with no angular change, no rotation, no shear deformation, but only the lengths of the respective edges are getting altered. So, it is a case of pure linear deformation, no angular deformation, okay. And then in such a case, we have two things satisfied. One is there is no effective viscous effect because the viscous effect comes through what? Viscosity into the rate of shear deformation. So, if the rate of shear deformation is 0, it does not matter whether viscosity is 0 or not. So, inviscid effect is not always through viscosity equal to 0. It may be the rate of shear deformation equal to 0 because eventually we are interested about whether the shear stress is 0 or not. So, if the shear stress is 0, it does not matter whether it is 0 because of mu equal to 0 or because of rate of shear deformation equal to 0. Here it is 0 because the rate of shear deformation is 0. So, it does not have any effect of vis viscous shear, it does not have any effect of rotationality. So, for it is effectively like an inviscid and irrotational flow and for such a flow, we will show later on that you can apply Bernoulli's equation between any two points in the flow field disregarding where they are. And uh, we will now go into a more rigorous way of establishing this very important consideration. So, to do that what uh, we will do, we will uh, leave this example and go back to the Euler's equations of motion along 
the different directions. So we have written the Euler's equation of motion along x which is uh, which is there in the board. Similar equations are there along y and z. Now what we are interested to, we are interested to write or to find what is the difference in pressure between two points. So let us say that we have two points 1 and 2 which are quite close so that they are connected by a position vector dl. dl is given by dxi plus dyj plus dzk. Okay. So this is the position vector that we are looking for. We are what is our interest to find out what is the difference in pressure between points 1 to 2. So whatever we did in the previous problem a bit more informally, we will now try to generalize it for a very general case that what happens in that case. To do that, we will uh, note that if you want to find out the difference in pressure between the two points, here pressure is a function of what? x, y and z. So you can write this as the sum of these three partial derivative terms. Each of these terms we can substitute from each component of the equation of motion. So the first term you can substitute from the x component of the equation of motion which is written below. So let us write that. So this will be minus of, so this uh, you are writing now the plus of this one. So that means this term will become minus the right hand side. So that will become minus of rho then plus a body force. So plus rho bx dx. dx with dx multiplication will come separately. We are just isolating the dp dx term. So we are not writing the dx together with this. So if you also consider the dx term together with this then it will be the entire thing multiplied by dx. Now we will try to write it in a compact form because uh, like uh, it is possible to utilize some of the very well known identities of vector calculus to simplify it. So what we will do is we will write this particular term in a, in a vector calculus notation. So we can write this as v v dot with gradient of u, right. So then you will get these terms. Keeping that in mind that other terms will also give similar expressions like what will change for the second term in place of this u it will be v, in place of this u it will be v, in place of bx it will be by like that. So it is very, very analogous and we can write the general expression for dp as minus rho. Now we will collect all the terms we will keep the, all the terms of similar type together. this is one term, then next we will write that acceleration term uh, that is the convective component of the acceleration term, this is the temporal component, then minus rho
and the body force term okay so these three types of terms are there we will uh, just for the writing convenience we will call it term 1 and there is a logic behind that these terms are con containing uh, expressions of similar nature. So, we can simplify them in groups. Let us write or let us try to simplify terms 1, 2 and 3 separately. So, <coughs> we will do that keeping in mind that the term 1 is the transient term and when we are simplifying we will be keeping in mind that we will be utilizing the vector d l which connects the two points which are close to each other. So, the term 1 is minus rho. Now, can you write it in terms of the two vectors v and d l? Remember v has components u, v, w, d l has components d x, d y, d z. So, if you write for example like this dot with d l, then that expression and this is the same, it is a dot product of this with this, of course you have a partial derivative of that one. So, it is just writing the same expression in a vector form. Let us write the term 2. How do you write the term 2? Minus rho, again let us try to write using the vectors v dot Let us check whether this is all right or not. See at the end we have to keep in mind that this is a scalar term, right. So, first of all whatever is a vector operator it should give back a scalar. So, you have one dot product and the dot product and the product of that is expected to give back a scalar. You can just check, let us check that. So, you can write this as v dot del then u d x plus v d y plus w d z. So, it becomes of the same form as that given by the term 2. Now, it is possible to simplify the v dot del v using a vector identity. What is that? So, v dot del v is equal to One important thing we will see that whether the bracket is to be put here or after the v and till this is not complete. So, let us tentatively write it. This is a very well known vector identity. Now, you see that what is this v dot v is a scalar the gradient operator operating on it makes it a vector and this is very clear this is a vector. So, this should be a vector. So, when you have v dot del this is a scalar, but this being a vector it keeps it a vector. So, whenever you write an identity these are certain common sense things that you should check because uh, depending on on what you operate the same thing may look uh, may become a scalar and vector very easily depending on how you put your cross products and the dot products. Now, uh, 
why we are putting in this particular form is because here you get the vorticity vector and we were finding out that the condition of rotationality or irrot irrotationality has some influence on the pressure difference between the points and this vector solely is responsible for whether it is rotational or irrotational. Okay. So, we will uh, put that simplification here, we will put this as minus rho half in place of the curl of the velocity vector, we will write the vorticity, then dot dl. For the term 3, what we will assume, it is a, it is again a very general term, but we will assume that uh, the gravity is the only body force which acts along the negative z direction as we considered in the problem that we discussed just before this. So, what we will assume that B x is 0, B y is 0 and B z is minus g because that is the common thing that we encounter in many problems. But if there are other components of body force, you know that how to simplify like you can just put the corresponding components here. So, uh, then that will become term 3 will just become minus rho g d z. Since it has just only one scalar component, it is not useful to write it in a general vector form. It will not give us back many things. So, d p is a sum of term 1, term 2 and term 3. We can simplify the term 2 and term 3 further. Uh, let us let us try to simplify the term 2 one more step. So, minus rho, let us now consider the dot product of this with d l. So, half what is v dot v, v dot v is v square, where this capital V is the resultant velocity. So, <coughs> that we are writing this dot with this one sorry that is the first term and you also have a term plus rho v cross vorticity vector dot dl. You can recognize that it is like a scalar triple product of three vectors like a dot b cross c. Okay. So, we will uh, keep that simplification of for a moment and just consider the first term. So, what does the first term look like? Half that is the first term, I mean first term of the term 2 and then rho you can clearly see that the first term of the term 2 will become what it is like it will become d d x of v square it is the sum of the three partial derivatives will give the total one so this will become at the end the simplified form minus half rho d of v square. So, this is like not d dx just the total d. So, this is partial derivative with respect to x into dx, this is partial derivative of y into dy and that with respect to z into dz. 
so that is give the that is giving the total d plus the whatever term that is remaining now let us put back all the terms together in the equations so what is our equation our equation is term 1 plus term 2 plus term 3 is equal to 0 that means minus rho that is the term 1. So, let us sorry dp not 0 it was dp then term 2 in place of term 2 we will write minus half rho d v square plus rho maybe let us write d l dot v cross zeta that is the term 2 and term 3 is minus rho g d z is equal to d p. This is a compact form and it is possible to simplify it even further based on certain special cases. So, what special cases we will be interested in let us see. So, what special cases may be let us take all the terms in the same side. Uh, so, you have dp plus half rho dv square plus rho g dz up to this you can find some similarity with the Bernoulli's type of equation that you have encountered earlier but you are getting also some two extra terms. Let us write those extra terms. So, plus then minus rho this equal to 0. because these two terms are like beyond what you have encountered many times we will try to put more attention on the uh, to the last two terms we will uh, put the first important attention on the last term because this particular term in a case when it is a steady flow this trivially goes away so there is no big controversy or there is no big uncertainty in that that is quite understandable. But the last term there are many possibilities when the last term can become 0. What are the cases? So, if you just write it in a in a determinant form when you are having such a scalar triple product you can write it in terms of uh, determinants where each row of the determinant will represent the components of the vectors taken in the particular order. So, you have like dx for dl you have dx dy dz for v you have u v w for the vorticity you have okay now let us consider a case when this say rho 1 just look it into mathematically say rho 1 is a scalar multiple of the rho 2 when it is possible when the direction of dl and the direction of v are the same then one will just be the scalar multiple of the other because direction wise they are representing vectors oriented identically so when that is possible what is the special dl for which that is true if it is located along a streamline so 
if we consider this as like a term A, so we will identify certain cases when A becomes 0. So, A equal to 0 when certain cases, one is D L is along streamline. Let us call the streamline direction as D S, S for stream wise coordinates. When that is the case, we do not care whether it is an irrotational flow or not, it does not matter whether it has components, non zero components of the vorticity vector. Yes? Hmm. There is nothing called a streamline flow, first we have to understand. There is a streamline in a flow, there is nothing called streamline flow. Okay, next. This is what? This is the length element, this is the line element that you are considering. This is the component, these are the components of the velocity vector. What is the definition of a streamline? Such that tangent to the streamline at any point represents the direction of the velocity vector. So, tangent is this direction, dl, a small elemental direction and this is the velocity vector direction. So, if they are located in the same direction, that means they are parallel vectors. That is the definition of the streamline, it is nothing extra. So, dl is, if dl is located along a streamline, then we do not care whether it is a rotational or irrotational flow, but if it is not, then if the vorticity vector is identically equal to 0, then A will become 0, no matter whatever is like, uh, no matter whether DL is located along the streamline or not. So, vorticity vector is a null vector, this is irrotational flow. So, you can clearly see that if it is a steady and irrotational flow, these two terms go away and then sum of these three is 0, that means uh, if you integrate that, the integration will give a constant of integration and that is what we actually saw in the example, the problem that we discussed before uh, going through this derivation. There is a third case, I mean there could be many such cases, but a third case, say you have the V cross this vorticity vector is perpendicular to DL. These two cases are more common cases that you encounter. This is not a very common case you encounter, but this mathematically you cannot rule out. You have a vorticity vector, you have a velocity vector. You can find the cross product and take an element in a direction which is oriented along that cross product. And then if you take such an element, then for such an element also for steady flow, it will appear that the Bernoulli type of equation is valid. So, this is not a Bernoulli type of equation, this is in fact one step before that where we do not make any explicit assum assumption on how the rho or the density varies. So, this is still the Euler equation of motion. So, this is a more general way of writing the Euler equation of motion where you are considering all the individual components and trying to write that in a vector form. But at least we can understand that this term becomes 0 under what cases. So, let us say that uh, we are considering one such case. Let us say that we take an example, we are considering along a streamline. That is, what do we mean by along a streamline? That means we are interested to find out these changes. So, see this give, this relates what? This relates change in pressure, change in velocity, change in elevation with respect to a change in position vector from point 1 to point 2. So, when we are considering along a streamline, that means we are interested to evaluate that change by moving along a streamline. So, never consider something like a streamline flow, again I am repeating there is nothing called a streamline flow. In flow there are streamlines, but it is not a streamline flow. So, when you have a streamline, we are looking for the difference in like this, this variable along a streamline. So, when you have along a streamline and let us say steady flow as the first example, this is example 1. So, then what you have, then A term will become 0, this term because of steadiness will become 0. So, you have dp plus half rho dv square plus rho g dz equal to 0. This is known as Euler equation of motion along a streamline.
Now, this is valid both for compressible as well as incompressible flows, you are not yet committed of how the density changes. So, now we are interested to see that how the density changes. To do that, we will let us say we will write it in this form dp by rho plus half dv square plus rho g d z and try to integrate it. So, we will try to integrate it, the rho will not be there because rho we have already divided by rho. So, when we try to integrate it, what are the points over which we are integrating? We are integrating with respect to two points 1 and 2 which are located on the same streamline because we have considered along a streamline that is we are considering this particular case which has made the term a equal to 0. So, when we do that, this equal to 0, that is still valid for any type of flow, compressible or incompressible. Now, you make an assumption that rho is a constant, assume that is a special case of an incompressible flow. So, then what you can write? You can take the rho out of the derivatives. So, you can write p2 minus p1 by rho plus half v2 square minus v1 square plus g into z2 minus z1 is equal to 0. Okay. This is nothing but the Bernoulli's equation that is p1 by rho plus v1 square by 2 plus g z1 is equal to p2 by rho plus v2 square by 2 plus g z2. So, it is like the Bernoulli, it, it is in fact the Bernoulli's equation. Now, you tell that what are the assumptions that we followed in deriving this. So, this is the Bernoulli's equation. We will come into the physical significance of this Bernoulli's equation in the next lecture, but let us at least try to identify that what are the assumptions that we utilize to derive this. So, what are the assumptions? So, first start with the most basic assumption. When we wrote the equation of motion, what we assume? Okay, only gravity is the only body force, it is it is okay, but it is like it is very very explicit. What is not so explicit is inviscid flow. So, inviscid flow is very important. Then steady flow, density is constant, it is a special case of incompressible flow not irrotational flow, we have not taken this condition 3. When we take irrotational flow, we get a more freedom, then we need not be restricted along a streamline. But when we are considering along a streamline, then it need not be irrotational. If it is irrotational, fine. If it is not irrotational, irrotational still okay. So, along a streamline, that is what we considered in this example. And in, so these are the four ones that these are the four assumptions that we have considered in, in deriving this. Now, these are the assumptions that we commonly use because commonly we utilize the Bernoulli's equation along a streamline. At the same time, we must understand that these are not always the cases. Inviscid flow is the most important thing. Now, can you tell that if you are thinking about Euler's equation along a streamline, out of this, which assumption is not necessary? say the Euler's equation of motion along a streamline, density equal to constant is not necessary. So, density equal to constant is the additional assumption beyond the Euler's equation. Before, so after you make that assumption, uh, you have to also keep in mind that I would say the most important assumption is inviscid flow because many times we tend to apply the Bernoulli's equation in cases when viscous effects are very much present. Maybe Many times you have solved such problems in your earlier high school exercise uh, problems to solve uh, like to get the velocity, pressure and so on. We will see that that is not fundamentally correct. In some cases you can get rid of that and still get some qualitative picture. We will see that when and when not, but fundamentally it has to be in viscid flow. Steady flow 
is for this version of the Bernoulli's equation, but you can also have an unsteady version of the Bernoulli's equation that we will see uh, later on, maybe in the next class, that where we retain this term and we can write a Bernoulli's equation by considering even the steady flow along a streamline, unsteady flow along a streamline. So, only for this version it is steady flow and that is the standard Bernoulli's equation, but we also have unsteady Bernoulli's equation. So, for unsteady Bernoulli's equation the steady flow assumption is not required. Rho equal to constant is always required because you are taking rho equal to constant and taking out of the integral and along a streamline is required for this special case when you are not bothered about whether it is irrotational or not. If it is irrotational then this need not be the case. So, may be relaxed for irrotational flow. So, what is the summary? The summary is if it is an irrotational flow and other conditions are satisfied that is in V C it steady and rho equal to constant, you can write P by rho plus V square by 2 plus G Z is constant need not always be along a streamline. So, this is constant no matter whether you are considering the points 1 and 2 anywhere in the flow field that is very important. So, points 1 and 2 may be located anywhere in the flow field still this equation is satisfied if it is an irrotational flow. If it is not an irrotational flow then 1 and 2 have to be located along the same streamline. So, these are very very important fundamental assumptions that go behind the Bernoulli's equation. We will stop here today, we will continue again in the next class. Thank you.